All right. Well, it's two. Uh, it's two o'clock here on the East Coast. So, just want to say thanks to everybody who's attending this talk. My name is Russ Danner. I'm a VP of Products at Crafter Software, and we are the principal contributor to the Crafter CMS open source project. We're going to spend today talking about content management systems, or CMS for short, along with their APIs. And uh, Crafter is an extremely modern headless plus git based cms now this is this idea of uh headless content management and apis is something i think a lot about in my role so just to give you some context of where i'm coming from uh, our platform is used by large organizations like marriott and mastercard as well as mid-sized organizations most oftenly uh to uh to really uh deliver uh, very highly innovative uh, digital experiences. A lot of these companies compete in a large way based on their digital experience. And that's sort of the, the background that informs my analysis. So jumping into it, jumping into the topic here, when we talk about headless CMS, we tend to focus on the multi-channel client side of the story more than the CMS itself, actually. And at a high level, that's because the distinguishing characteristic of headless CMS, at least on the surface, is that API client boundary. And what we're going to do in this talk is we're going to dig into that topic and then down below into the server over the next 40 minutes. So the server actually matters a lot. And I'm going to go ahead and spoil some of the reasons here, and then we're going to get into the details behind that. So the first reason is that websites work the way, they, you know, the way that they do. Nothing has really fundamentally changed in a very long time about the basic mechanics of how users and robots interact with websites. Another key thing here is that we want to be able to personalize and target our content. And oftentimes, the CMS is the best place to centralize that capability. Another thing that we want to be able to do is integrate other systems with our content. Uh, and so, again, sometimes the CMS is the best place to uh, to centralize that as well. And lastly, a bit of a general point, but we want some situational flexibility. Um, and with these in mind, I think you're going to see that a strong server side capability is a must. And specifically, the ability to program within the server uh, is, is a must. And so if we are going to program in the server, then I want to make a case that a Groovy based server is a great answer uh, to that problem. And we're going to explore that. I'm going to actually we use Groovy with Crafter, and I'll, I'll basically use Crafter as a little bit of an example to show you how that can uh, be, work out. So let's jump in and elaborate on these points. And because some of you may be new to the topic of headless CMS, I'm going to start by talking about what it is and how we got there and so on, and we'll go from there. So in the beginning, uh, headless CMS really was a response to native uh, applications. And... Um, native mobile applications and the um the the thing is that people really liked uh native mobile applications but there was some pretty obvious uh issues on the operational side and um what they were was that you couldn't really deploy uh functionality or content without doing uh, a heavy deployment so a, a bit of a challenge and um and so to, to solve that, uh, this in the uh, to solve that, what we did was we introduced this. You know, the, as an industry, we knew that the right answer uh, for that is that uh, we would need to introduce a CMS. So, um, and the thing is here that traditional CMSs uh, weren't really able to pivot to to handle the the, the need very well. And let me just tell you a little bit about like what the, the issue was there. So at the time, we've been using traditional websites to to manage, uh, you know, our, our websites uh, for more than a decade. But the, these traditional these um, traditional systems were again having a little bit of trouble pivoting to to manage that uh, mobile that mobile uh, uh, use case. And it's, 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 it's the fact is that these traditional CMSs were monolithic. Uh, they assume that they would supply the presentation, and they tend to be page-centric, and that's a real issue, right? Um, another thing here is that these traditional CMSs, I think in a good way, actually, over the course of, 
of years and years, had built up a, a robust set of editing uh, features in context editing, drag and drop, and so on, in context preview, uh, SEO tools, and so on, to, to help marketers build, manage, and optimize uh, their digital their digital properties. And um, the, the thing is, is that on the mobile side of things, these native mobile applications, they just don't require uh, those that functionality, at least at that time, they don't. Um, and so, you know, so that there's not a great fit there. There's a lot of functionality that's not a great fit. What these applications really just needed was a very non-page centric, uh, way to, to get content in a presentationless format as an API and something that's really simple that they could get to market with really quickly and compete with, uh, you know, other, uh, other companies trying to do the same thing. So as a result, a whole new simplified class of like headless CMS systems showed up in the market to fill that need. And this architecture, um, you know, it, 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 it were you know it pulls content as updates from the CMS in real time uh, and enables business users to update the content without having to you know have the user get involved and download anything. So it it uh, satisfies that need. But unlike a traditional CMS, uh, because the application has its own native user interface, these applications were able to basically pull content in a presentationless format, typically as JSON, and then take on the responsibility of rendering and operating the user interface. So it's at this point uh, that uh, headless CMS infrastructure really becomes mainstream. Well, there were there were definitely CMSs uh, like Crafter had content as an API, but the concept of a headless CMS as a, as a platform that became a mainstream concept. And this is where things get a little bit interesting because these headless CMS platforms um, and because of their heritage, they've always been pretty simple. And for the most part today, they remain simple. In fact, very simple, especially when you compare them to their traditional CMS counterparts with like all that functionality that I talked about uh, in support of, of creating websites and Mart and you know supporting MarTech operations and so on. And I like this visual here that basically, you know, if you consider that the traditional webs uh, traditional CMS is a lot like this application here on the on you know where we've got maps and gps and you know there's a whole set of tools it's a lot, lot more general purpose we can use it for a lot of things and then we've got this simple you know really point solution you know find me find me true north uh you know uh compass uh, kind of a solution and that's a lot more like a, like a headless cms and so just to kind of illustrate what i mean by that in in technical terms let's look at how uh headless cmss are constructed so here, uh, everything starts with a headless CMS with a, a basic content type. You, you define the type and you're essentially building the definition or the structure of your content. Some CMS platforms kind of abstract this uh, as and, and you know, you're, you're building a type and, and there's a little bit more functionality there. Other CMSs and a lot of CMSs, you're really just kind of building the form, the content form that ultimately, um, you know, uh, authors will enter content into. In either case, at the end of the day, you're just defining the fields and the property of the content objects you need. From there, the CMS can take that definition and render a content entry form for authors to enter their content. And on save, right, that content is stored into some kind of repository or database. It's, it's that simple. Headless architecture doesn't really say anything about what that database is, what that system can do. That's all implementation specific. So does it version? How does it version? Are there any other functionalities that it can do? All of that is, you know, really up to the implementation. It's something you want to really look into as you, you know, choose solutions. So with that, um, so with that said, when a consumer wants to pull content, right, what they do is they go and they pull content via an API and what they get back is, typically JSON, and you can see an example of that here. And uh, that that is typically fixed uh, with most headless CMS platforms. There's a, you know, the structure that you create as your content de definition really dictates the, uh, the structure that you get back uh, in terms of the JSON. And we'll talk about why that's a challenge later, okay? Now, you can see that based on this, it's, it really is pretty simple. And, uh, you know, and so the thing there is, though, that it really does work well for multi-channel support. 
by moving the presentation concerns entirely to the client, you free up the developer to use any front end framework they want uh, for the particular problem that they need to solve. And they also can much more easily reuse that content because the CMS doesn't have any pre, you know, conceived notions of how the content will be used. And so reuse is, is much, uh, much more uh, simple to achieve. It's really perfect for use cases like native mobile apps and digital assistants and, uh, you know, smartwatches and things. And this is an important concept because new channels emerge every day. This is some examples of channels here. And the ability to address those channels quickly is a huge deal, right? And so with that, finally, developers who were working with content and digital experiences uh, who had struggled with traditional CMS, they really you know, struggle with the, the, the restrictions of traditional CMS, especially on the front end, we're able to, you know, get a new use case, quickly de develop a solution for it, get it to market. And so marketers were thrilled and developers became heroes, right? However, uh, websites continue to be developed with traditional CMS. So Developing with traditional CMS has always been pretty challenging and due to the monolithic nature of these systems and the restrictions imposed in terms of the front end, um, you know, developers, again, they have a hard time with that. And so this really results in a low rate of innovation and it's frustrating to developers and uh, to, to marketing. So kind of a kind of a, a, a problem there, but websites are, you know, it's a, a major use case. So you gotta make sure uh, we have a good answer for that. Now, at around that time, uh, native mobile applications uh, had taught users that uh, taught users that the user experience could be really good, right? That, and that much better than they, what they were getting on the web. So, uh, and 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 so they started saying, well, web developers started saying, how can I emulate that on a on the on a web page? And so they started working on these frameworks called single page applications and. Single page applications um, are a whole new frameworks, right? Uh, uh, that developed to support this. They're much more responsive uh, and multi uh, channel and mo mobile friendly right from the get go. Uh, the UI is much more snappy and feels native because, uh, because of the way that content is managed and data is managed in the background and, and retrieved in the background and managed to state in the background. And new frameworks have been developed to make it really easy to develop these. And uh, so some really powerful productive tools have been put together to, to build these. And on top of that, unlike native applications, these applications are simple to deploy because they're web technology. So that's a huge deal. And so SPAs truly feel like, like apps because the uh you know after the first page load because there are no big screen refreshes and the client and the server communicate in the background with small action specific conversations that update the application state behind the scenes just like a native application and and this is kind of an important nugget here that spas are really a pattern for building apps and i think the key word here is apps um, with a single page load that replaces an old pattern of building apps that was basically stringing together a bunch of web pages. Now, SPAs really do improve the web app experience for end users, and it also really improves the experience for developers. So these are frameworks, that, and these are frameworks that I'm uh, talking about, like Angular, React, Vue, and there are many others. And they're, again, created to help developers build these single page applications quickly. And the cool thing is here that these frameworks really uh, embrace this paradigm of a single app uh, instead of an app cobbled together um, to buy multiple web pages. And so as a result, they provide sophisticated data layers, event backplanes, uh, the ability to reuse components, and they leverage modern development languages and transpilers like TypeScript and Dart, you know, things that developers want to work with today. So uh, you know, a, some pretty big advances there. And because the SPAs retrieve uh, content in the back end as, as REST APIs at a high level, then they fit in with this headless architecture. So it's no surprise that, you know, developers uh, that are working on, uh, working with traditional CMS and struggling with tr traditional CMS see that users like these single page applications because they feel native, that they they 
see other developers working and building apps with these tools that are you know really modern and productive and that fit in with their architecture and they think well i need to use this for my website and so that that pattern takes off and um and so this is great because it frees them as a website developer from having to work inside the constraints of a traditional cms and so that's it right uh we're done you know we've kind of found the perfect solution and uh there's nothing much more to do here right so the problem with that is that it's not really true there's there's a lot of issues uh with that and so the problem is that the architecture ignores a lot of the fundamental things about the nature of websites and how they work and these headless cms implementations that we have are so simple that they don't really provide enough support for enterprise class use cases. So focusing on uh, the web here, uh, when we create websites with any you know, level of, uh, of sophistication, it gets pretty complicated quickly. And so I, I wanna kind of focus on that um, and, and talk about it. Websites, of course, are not the only channel in this multi-channel world anymore, but it's absolutely the major channel for most organizations. And so let's spend some time talking about the challenges there uh, in terms of using uh, them to and single page applications and headless to drive websites. And it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier that, you know, these single page applications are a pattern of building apps with a single page rather than building apps with a bunch of pages put together, strung together to make an app. That is to say that apps and websites are different animals. Uh, and what I mean there is that you interact with them differently. And to, to be sure, there's a ton of overlap here. And so we would kind of want to focus on what's salient here. What, what are the real differences? And one key difference is, right, that originally we were taking web pages and trying to construct applications. And now we're kind of going the other way. We're taking an application and trying to get web pages out of that, right? Um, and so... That's a key difference. And web pages, the interaction model is much different. You have, you know, sites have random or random access. They're most often stateless, uh, and you need to be able to get to them with a unique URL. So you have to you have to create ways to do that with the single page applications in a way that authors can manage those URLs. Uh, you've you've you got web pages that are crawled randomly for SEO, which we'll talk about in a bit here. Uh, the interaction model is really page by page, right? And users come in, they sort of stay for a couple of uh, pages, and then they leave. And crawlers come in in spider links, and they typically they they view each new page or each link that they follow as a new page. So there's uh, that'll come into play later. Now, as we talk talk a little bit more about SEO and crawling. So earlier we saw that um, we saw the way that client side uh, SBAs are rendered. And, and so we saw, now we can see in this diagram here a little bit more about how the time it takes, uh, for that to happen. So we, here you can see, we kind of wait for the base page to show up and then we wait for all the code to come down to the to client. And then the, uh, then the code, and then the framework picks up and, and starts processing that code. And finally it's got some markup, which it gives to the browser to render. And all of that takes quite a bit of time actually. Uh, for that, that first page load. Then after that, it's all these little simple page loads. So the first page load is the issue here. And it turns out that the alternative, you know, rendering on the server for the first page load it can be much, much faster when it's done uh, properly. And here you can see an example of that. Basically, you go to the server, you request your markup, you get everything you need to render right away to the browser, and it, it starts rendering. And we know for websites, again, uh, that faster page loads translate directly to happier customers, greater satisfaction levels. And we know that because of that, search engines give faster web pages a little bit of a boost in their ranking. It's not obviously the, the major part of what, what they do uh, in terms of boosting, but it's a, it is a factor. And that kind of takes us to this next topic here, which is search engine optimization. And the challenge here, the technical challenge, is that if we're going to render the page with JavaScript, then we have to rely on the search engine to execute that JavaScript and to get the content responses and figure out what we intended to show the user. And there's a lot of variability in that. And no SEO, um, you know, SEO expert or, or organization that depends on SEO to drive traffic to their site is gonna take that kind of chance. They want control, they want consistency. And 
if we are going to have spiders coming to our site who are going to give us a boost for being faster, then yes, we absolutely want to get this page as fast as possible. So all this idea that we're going to wait for things to render in the client is just not something we we want to achieve or we want we want to allow. So so server side rendering is important in the website context, particularly in the, you know without an authentication. So as a result, we've seen some interesting things happen here. Um, first, uh, you see a new kind of a resurgence of static site generation, and this is you know where you take uh, content and you process it through templates uh, and you kind of bake the website into HTML pages that you can then put on a server. Uh, and this is a pattern that we used to use prior to the early 2000s to build, uh, you know, to build uh, websites that were templated. And it's kind of come back. And to be honest, there's nothing wrong with this pattern. Uh, um, it's it's a it's a fine pattern, um, but it it does have some limitations. And I think you know we've got to you know understand that static site, uh, like I said, static site generation, the, 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 a good tool here would be to talk about would be Gatsby. It's pretty one, it's one that people know. Kind of iterate through every route in your application again, build and cache that HTML version, and then you can put that stuff on the infrastructure. So some pretty obvious advantages there. It's fast because it's rendered ahead of time. It's uh, search engines like it because again, they it's what they're used to receiving, this markup that they can interpret. And it and ops likes it because it's you know it's just a web server. It's a super reliable, uh, trusted infrastructure or an S3 bucket can be distributed anywhere. So it's a really really kind of uh, it's got some significant benefits. And we love this uh, kind of architecture at Crafter. We we support it, but the limitations are that it only really works for smaller sites. Uh, a small change to like a header or an article can mean that basically you have to regenerate hundreds of pages, thousands of pages, sometimes more. And it's a kind of a science project to optimize that. So it's it gets really difficult um, if you if you go in that space. So for larger sites, generating um, generating pages can take a long time. And that makes it difficult for authors to preview and deploy and so and deploy their changes and so on. So um, so that kind of starts to bring us to a place where we can kind of see two major issues coming together. And that is basically that one, we want to take advantage of headless architectures and SPA development. And, um, but we need to render our sites on the server. And two, if we are going to get into the website space with this technology, then we need to give authors the technology and the tools and things that they're used to for managing websites, right? Uh, for, for an MVP, a kind of solution like a mobile app, native mobile application or Alexa or something, something new, a new battleground, we're willing to accept some ba pretty basic functionality. But when we get into some you know space that we know that's established, it's got rules of engagement, it's got known success patterns, we need all the tools that make us efficient. So we're not going to just, you know, um, say, okay, let's just go to, go to inferior tools. Um, so that's the other problem there. So I would like to say basically with that, that you know all the kind of low hanging fruit with headless CMS has kind of been picked, right? Simple content entry forms, simple repositories, simple fixed APIs can't really carry us forward. In fact, even in some of these other spaces that were sort of acceptable to be MVP before, uh, really now need to kind of grow up and have uh, uh, more and more tooling to support them as well. People wanna know um, how these things are being used, more metrics and things like that as well. So. OK, so we're at the point where we really need a CMS to evolve again. We we need our CMS to have all the advantages of headless CMS, but all the capabilities of traditional CMS in a way as well. I mean, and, and so but to evolve past some of the problems that we've had and we need a CMS that's you know great for developers, that makes them productive with modern tools and process. That's great for authors with rich tools for editing and managing their digital experiences and real good for ops, too, so that they can easily support dev ops operations and, you know, operate and deliver our these solutions at scale. So um, so on the technical side, we also, again, want to be able to server side render websites so we can keep those use cases happy and support some of this. Uh, personalization and integration. And that's kind of where we're going to get into the APIs now. So let's talk about uh, start with integration. 
And it's very, integration is very common in any kind of inter, you know, interesting digital experience. You know, things like e-commerce, online scheduling, search. I mean, something as basic as search is typically an integration with you know Elasticsearch and Solar and so on. Recommendation engines, inventory systems, CRM systems, you name it. We, when you get into you know these digital experiences, we integrate with them. And oftentimes we need to bring our content and the data from these services together. And sometimes this can be done on the client. Sometimes it can be done in another service. A lot of times it's, you know, can, you know, can be done in the CMS if it supports it. And um, one of the bigger challenges in, in integrating with these systems is at just a fundamental nature of the uh, APIs. And that is uh, what we would call the shape of the API. So this is just one class of integration challenges. And so the shape, what we mean by shape is that, you, you know, the, 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 what it looks like to request the API. What's the what's the calling? Um, you know, how do we, what's URL? What 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 do we need to send it? What, what's the response going to look like? That's another part of the shape. And uh, if if your CMS has a fixed kind of concept of that API, then you have no control over uh, the the shape of it. And so um, that that can be a challenge because having control over the shape makes integration much easier. And there's just a couple of benefits here just to kind of get illustrate the point, you know, it, one, it makes, it makes it so that we can make our APIs consistent with the rest of the enterprise. Um, it makes it so that we can optimize APIs for specific use cases uh, if we need to. And it makes it so that we can mimic existing APIs uh, as well. If we can control the shape, we can mimic the APIs. In fact, this concept of shape is so important uh, uh, around APIs that one of the Main, it's one of the main selling points of a, of a very popular API specification that's been growing in the market called GraphQL. And I don't really have time to go into all of GraphQL, but I will kind of try to highlight here a little bit about it because CMSs like Crafter that support GraphQL, and se several do, um, have give you right away some control over the response shape of your APIs. And so to illustrate that, I thought I'd quickly kind of show you a REST, bunch of REST APIs and then show you a GraphQL query that approximates that. And we can look at some of the differences there. So here we have uh, three REST APIs, traditional REST APIs, right? One to get the user, one to get the posts of that user, and one to get the followers of that user. And so here we can see some challenges. First, we've got three calls. Second, if we ever wanted to change a field name, right, we'd have to version that API because other people might be calling it. We don't want to break those other clients. So we can't change the shape of that API. So one, the shape, the, the granularity, that part of the shape is that it's very chunky and we've got to make multiple calls. The next thing is we can't change field names or things in the response uh, because that shape is fixed without versions in this model. And also if we wanted to add fields, which is another shape change, then we're, let's say that we need, we get, we want to add Alexa and we need a new field for Alexa. But our mobile app doesn't need that field. Now we're starting to send bits to other channels that don't need that content. And that's just inefficient. So um, these are kind of some shape challenges. And, and graph, what GraphQL is, is it's a way for us to write a query in a standard query language uh, and then issue it over REST to a system, any system really. But a lot of CMSs are kind of picking this up. And, and in the query, we specify what we want back in the response and what we want that response to look like. So GraphQL is really a specification for defining and handling these types of queries. So as an example here, this is a single GraphQL query that the you know that handles the request that we were making before. It's a single request for the user, the posts, and the followers, all in one efficient request, right? And with GraphQL, you can see you have some uh, you know some basically some control over the shape of that request because we can even do things like rename fields and so on, which is hard to show here. The point is that, you know, this is the way that modern APIs are moving and it's because shape matters. And again, CMSs that offer GraphQL are giving you some, uh, headless CMSs are giving you some control over shape. Uh, if you are really dealing with a CMS that has that fixed API where you've got you content type and that's your API, then you're gonna have some challenges here because you don't have that flexibility. Now, in some cases, having control over the response shape 
however limited it is or not, is not enough, right? And many times we need control over the exact shape of the request and the response. And a great example of this would be any time that there's a client, a pre-existing client that's already written, that we're going to take over the API with the CMS and try to replace it. And an obvious example might be like replacing one headless CMS with another, for example. Um, but there's lots of sort of examples out there um, in real world deployments where we have an app that, uh, you know, it has a pre-built API and the consumer wants to put uh, that under CMS control. And in this scenario, you've only got a couple of options. You can change the client, uh, which can be pretty expensive. You can add a proxy between the CMS and the client to, to do a transformation, which is clunky as a one-off solution. So you, in order to you know explore that, you'd really need some kind of enterprise kind of answer to that. Uh, and then the other option is to have a CMS that can do it. So just a quick example of that uh, in terms of Crafter here is, uh, is a website uh, that uh, from Penn Mutual, a major life insurance company that had built their React base.com site before they even chose a CMS, right? The, the reason why they did that is that they needed to get out to market and they, you know, kind of wanted to parallel and we're going to look for a CMS and we're going to get going on this development at the same time. And so they made assumptions about what the API would look like. They kind of accepted, well, maybe we have to change this stuff. But what we were able to do with crafters is say, no, we can, you know, what's the API that you assumed? We can, we can mimic that. You, you have complete control over the request shape and the response shape. So you don't have to rebuild that aspect of your site. You just have to, you know, uh, you just have to integrate like the rest calls, for example. And so that's a, a big success for them. And it's a total, it basically shows total flexibility. And it's really what we're talking about when we mean like supporting a high rate of innovation and, ha and that being important and that flexibility being important. Here's another example of integration. Suppose you uh, are running a franchise of restaurants and you have a website that manages the menus for the online ordering. So in that case, you know where the user is ordering from uh, because maybe they're getting delivery uh, and you, uh, you know through your supply chain what ingredients that restaurant has uh, on hand. So at that point, you can personalize what's on the menu to what's possible for that restaurant to make uh, because, you, because you've integrated the inventory system and the ordering system, and um, and so then your content APIs can be much much smarter. And this is a great example of you know these are both external systems integrated to help make content choices. And this last example here is a real world example for us. Uh, it's not just an example of of you know integration, uh, it which involves external systems, and it's not really just an example that crosses multiple channels, which in our case it does. Right, it's the same API that drives the websites, the native mobile applications, and, and any kind of digital assistance-based ordering. Uh, it's a great example of personalization where you're understanding what the user wants and giving them that. And it's only possible in this case because the CMS has some back-end uh, programming capability. Now, it's perfectly reasonable to ask, well, why, why not move all that integration and personalization and all that stuff to, to other services, microservices? And um, and that's not only a reasonable question; it's a perfect, it's a great solution. Um, and Crafter fits into that, of course. Uh, we can just be the content piece. But that said, this kind of infrastructure, it, it, one, it, the sophistication of it, the complexity of getting it uh, in place, it requires it needs to be justified. And a lot of organizations, even really large organizations, they don't have this infrastructure yet. Maybe some some are starting to work on it. It's a great place to go, and we fully support that. But in the absence of this kind of infrastructure, uh, centralizing any kinds of integrations that are going to deal with content, merging content and data from services or personalization, that can belong in the CMS uh, and can fit very well there. And also, regardless of where you put it, you want to make sure the CMS can help authors manage any kind of personalization rules and things, or at least preview how that's going to work. That's kind of a different topic, but also a little bit germane. Now, if we are going to program on the server, then... We need to, you know, we need to figure out what language we're going to do it in. And at Crafter, we take a kind of a stance here that at the basic level, all of our functionality is API based. So uh, we'll work with any language, any framework, any topology, um, be and basically all based on interacting with us through APIs. 
but we do provide deep support for Groovy programming inside of our server components, as well as some other languages through language specific bindings. So just to kind of get concrete about that, what you can see here in this diagram is that our delivery server component um, in, in the diagram here, this is just our delivery uh, uh, component. And what it is, is it's a really high performance dynamic content delivery engine. It's stateless, it sits against a distributed content store and delivers dynamic content responses as API responses. And also we can render content so we can, we can do that as well. And we also have authoring and deployment server components that are the same way here that, you know, and are constructed the same way. This is like the general architecture here. And you can see that the general architecture is that it's a Java based application, this Java based services, uh, you know, at the, at the base, uh, they have REST APIs on top of them. The whole thing is brought together by Spring, uh, Spring Framework and the IOC container. And then admins, this is the critical part here, that admins can then plug in their own capabilities uh, to our plugin system and our marketplace system. And the key programming language there is, is in Groovy. So plugins come in a bunch of different forms. Um, one, you can plug in GraphQL plugins, things like fetchers, uh, create your own custom fetchers, and 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 there you can go beyond that to help uh, you know modify your schema. You can plug in template controllers for if you're doing some kind of server side rendering, which we support. If you're if you're completely headless or you've got some headless use case and you want to control, you know the shape of your of your REST APIs, then you can plug in REST controllers. And we're gonna look at one of those. You'll see how simple that is. And even things like jobs. I mean, these are just some examples of plugins uh, all based on, uh, on Groovy. And the point is that in our server, Groovy is the main mechanism for plugging in custom server-side code. Now, why Groovy? Well, for starters, we are the bones of our system is Java so and Spring. So that's kind of, it makes sense that as part of the Java family, we would leverage Groovy, but there's much more to it than that. Groovy is a scripting, you know, it's a scripting language and that's critical to us uh, because we don't need to compile it we don't, uh, and package it in any, you know, uh, fancy way, like as a war file or something like that. Uh, we can treat it as, uh, as, as content in a sense. We can deploy it just like we would deploy content. And Crafter, we have, you know, planet scale deployments where we have servers all over the world and, and, and this allows us to just push code in all directions uh, through normal deployment mechanisms. It's super, super powerful in supporting that use case. Also from a development perspective, developers love Groovy. It's flexible, it has a lot of syntactical sugar and you, they don't need to compile and deploy it. So they like that kind of flow that they have. So I'd like to look a little bit at some pros and cons here for Groovy. Again, pretty big, uh, uh, user population, especially as part of the Java community, I'm going to kind of make the assumption here that, uh, you know, Java and Groovy, they're not the same, but they are, you can run Java inside of Groovy, um, Java classes and so on. So here we can see that Java and Groovy rank really high uh, on some worldwide language popularity standards. Java is consistently in the top three and Groovy although not nearly as popular, it really does rank very high, especially if you discount some things like C, C++, assembly, SQL that just don't really map to what we're talking about here. Um, and just to be, you know, show some relationship to other languages more visually, you can see here that over the last couple of years, Java ranks really well when compared to, to JavaScript, which is hugely popular in our space. Um, you also see at the top there that Python's doing quite well, but that has a lot to do with the fact that it's, you know, system op systems, admins have, have picked it up, uh, sciences and, and things like that use use Python. So they've got a, a big bump in some different spaces outside of web, although they are used for web. Another reason we chose Groovy is that it's a really rich, mature programming platform. It's object oriented. It supports closures, threading, inline debugging. It's, it's, it's really performant and flexible. So there's, there's so much to like about it. Uh, and I just thought we would look at some code right uh, here. So let's do that. So here's a simple REST controller from, from Crafter. This shows that we can, com, we can create any REST API inside Crafter. Mo, most often they're content APIs, but they can do almost anything you'll see, kind of get a notion for that. And what this guy does, we'll come back and look at the code in just a second. What, it, what it's doing is integrating with AWS recognition. 
and that's an AI ML based service that can inspect images and video content to essentially determine what's in the image. And that can be used on the authoring side to make things more searchable, but it can also be used to moderate user generated content. So it's super powerful kinds of integration here. And um, so if we look at the code, what's it doing? Well, we're picking up um, uh, first, and this is something that's not shown in the diagram, that basically if you put a Groovy script, this Groovy script in a special folder in Crafter, it's kind of like a rail. It automatically becomes a REST API. So it's really easy to create REST APIs first and specify how, what, how they take up URL space. But then uh, you can see that the code is also simple here. We're picking up a spring bean at the top. Um, and I'll show you how that's defined. Then we're going to check some parameters and just do some, uh, you know, uh, precondition checking. And then basically we're going to use that service that we grabbed and uh, pass in some of the parameters. And at the end, we take whatever we get back as a result and we return it. And Crafter automatically then marshals whatever that object is as JSON. So again, I have complete control of the shape of the incoming. Do I want to create a pose to get? What do the URLs look like? What's the inbound JSON look like? for example, and I give you the object and you render it so I control the output as well. So I have complete control over that. And then here you can see the class that uh, is behind that. So um, so basically here at the top, you can see it's uh, it's you were grabbing some of this uh, AW, these AWS classes um, and leveraging them. And it, this is just a normal uh, Java class. Anything that Java can do, uh, Groovy can do as well, and we can do here in Crafter. And Groovy is compatible with some awesome application frameworks like Spring and testing frameworks as well. So we really like that. Um, here you see a few examples of Spring configuration where we're telling the Spring uh, service to create service beans that we can wire up together with our out-of-the-box services or other services that you create. So we take advantage of that inversion of control, and then we make it really easy to get in our controller. There you see the the bean name that you saw in the in the Groovy controller, which really just makes it so that we're programming by interfaces, which is you know just a good good uh, uh, pattern. Uh, and then probably one of the biggest benefits of Groovy in Java is just the sheer volume of the libraries out there. Uh, you know, for example, um, the example that we looked at was a fairly sophisticated AWS integration, and we were leveraging AWS as APIs. But in Maven, there are 23 million artifacts, right? Uh, almost everybody creates native Java libraries or Java bindings for their software. It's just the way it is. Uh, Java is that popular. And another good data point, and this doesn't have to do with Maven, it has to do with Apache Foundation, is that Java dominates the Apache Foundation in terms of projects. 241 projects uh, are, uh, and the lion's share of projects are based on Java. So uh, it towers over all the other languages. And then last on my list here, but certainly not least, is that Groovy, unlike Java, script uh, is script, so it can be treated as as a code as content, we call it. And again, that goes back to just being able to just take a deployment, easily move it through environments, and then publish it out to you know live servers, for example, uh, anywhere in the world very easily without a lot of deployment headaches and, and process, because these are, at the end of the day, they're just files. So it's a really uh, powerful mechanism when you're building, you know, planet scale, dynamic content delivery machinery, and we love it for that. Along the way, we've also learned uh, some lessons as well. And so I thought we could talk about some, uh, some cons uh, here. So let's, let's talk about that. So for one, Groovy is pretty uh, flexible, and you might consider it too flexible. There's off, off uh, the, the syntax is duct type, and there's a lot of rope to hang yourself with. And that's true with any of the languages today, but I think it's worth um, you know, pointing that out. Another issue here is that it can be hard to secure. Um, and again, I'll kind of explain what does that mean. Uh, and this is this this is really about being hard to secure from from within, you know, and this applies to any development uh, kind of solution where your developers are developing software and they get to deploy software. Um, and so on. If they have malicious intentions, then they can write malicious code and get it out into production. And of course, we all use process, uh, you know, our DevOps processes, our code reviews, our corporate policies to avoid that. But we, uh, you know, and I think many people do use static analysis to try and figure out what's going on 
uh, and sandboxings. And actually, we've built into our platform sandboxing to try and make sure that we can detect some things that are out of bounds. What's this developer trying to do uh, with this code? And uh, that's really challenging with Groovy because of the the flexibility of the nat of the of the uh, language itself. And uh, in Crafter, we're we're we are trying to do this. We we run, we evaluate things at compile time, even at runtime, and this goes way beyond the sort of typical JVM um, policies. So, um, just a note here. I know I'm dating myself with this uh, Office Space screenshot, but uh, if you haven't seen this movie, you yeah, gotta see this movie. Uh, so let's jump back to sandboxing here. It's pretty hard to do. And uh, this is just a really simple example that kind of shows at what we're talking about here. Um, look at the example here. Basically, I've, I'm defining uh, a variable and I'm assigning it my object dot some moniker. Well, in Groovy, it'll actually give me back a response uh, regardless of whether that moniker is a pointer to a variable or a function. It'll figure that out and it'll call it for me if it's a getter. So it just treats, it basically tries to be like, oh, I'm bean friendly and beans have property names and I'll just treat that getter as a mean property. Well, from a static analysis perspective, I don't know that that's not somebody, you know, there's a call a getter that has some malicious code in it. So I've got to then dig into that uh, and, and, and try to figure that out and look and basically assume the worst and then dig into it. So it's, it's much harder than it kind of like has to be, so to speak. Um, and it's because of the syntactic tool sugar. And that's just, that's just, being objective here. Um, and the last con here that I want to say is that despite how popular Java is and how powerful Groovy is, not everybody uses it. So for our part, we do make it possible through our REST APIs to use any language. And um, for some specific platforms like uh, JavaScript and Node.js, we do have native bindings that wrap our REST APIs and that bring uh, our services natively into those platforms. And uh, because that's a big community for us as well. And this is also our node support is also where Crafter, you know, if you've built with SPAs and you want to do dynamic content um, rendering, not, not, you know, static page generation, but dynamic rendering uh, of uh, with server side rendering, then you can use Node.js with Crafter uh, to do that with your single page application. So that's kind of fits in there as well. And uh, that all has to do. Uh, at the basis with our SDK around these REST APIs, as you can kind of see that there. Um, so it, it really makes it feel like it's native and in the same process. So, okay, well, we're really close to finishing up here. We kind of got to the finish line and um, I want to wrap up with some takeaways and then I'm going to just take some of the questions. I can see some questions about debugging and so on. So um, let's go ahead and wrap up, right? So first, new digital experiences are emerging every day. And we need an answer for that. And we know that traditional CMS was not a great answer for that. But headless architectures have been a great answer to that. And I specifically chose this example here as a headless e-commerce uh, platform to show that this is not a trend specific to CMS. Headless is a trend, period. It's the way that things are going. I mean, look for no further than Amazon to understand that that APIs is the way to, you know, to build your organization's capabilities and to expose those capabilities. So... Uh, this is this is the right way to do it. Um, and uh, of course, uh, headless CMS is great for developers. Uh, it really frees them up to use the right tool for the job for the particular um, you know the particular platform that they're um, building for, whether that's you know whether that is a native mobile application or Alexa or well, watch doesn't matter, or if it's a website, but with the websites, we have to kind of keep in mind, that we can't get carried away. There's more to it than just, hey, return some content on a REST API. Um, you know, many of the uh, CMS solutions out there don't have backends um, that are up to the task. They're just too simple uh, and too trivial, like sort of lack the authoring support. They don't have enough programming support to address these sort of very common enterprise class needs, including integrating uh, your content uh, with other services and doing things like personalization or even just simple things like controlling the shape of your APIs. So, you know, make you want to make sure you've got that, 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 that headless CMS is, is up to task there. Um, and uh, I think as, uh, you know, Crafter CMS, as an example, is a kind of a proven open source headless, what we call headless plus CMS that does address a lot of these needs, right? And with respect to the to programming, um, you know, we've 
leverage Groovy and its scripting support along with uh, Spring Framework and uh, to, to great success uh, to provide really rich um, programming support on the back end to, to build great, you know, integrated APIs, integrated services that your digital experiences can uh, depend on to make it easy for us to operate with our marketplace, to make it easy for us to deploy those solutions. And again, a lot of this has to do with the fact that it's a scripting capability. And of course we get, again, we get the advantage of the power of that language, the size of the ecosystem, the sheer number of uh, libraries and so on out there. Um, and it really, all of this really enables uh, developers to take on any kind of you know challenge in the digital experience space. And so uh, with that, I do want to stop here and see if there are some questions. So go ahead. If you got more questions, go ahead and ask them in the questions and answers area. Um, while these are coming in, I'll just say if you want to learn more about Crafter, you can visit us at our uh, virtual booth here at ApacheCon, or you can sign into uh, you know our website, craftercms.org and uh, get some more information there. And we'd be happy to, we'd love to have you as part of our community. We have a Slack channel, other places where you can join as well. Uh, but craftercms.org is a great place to start and find those other resources. So with that, let's see. Um, we got one question here, which is really just how do you de deal with debugging in, in Groovy? Um, and I'll check, There's this is in the chat, and then we check the Q&A area as well. So, um, so in uh, so Groovy uh, debugs just like uh, Java um, in the way that we run it. Uh, we're running inside that Spring container, and you can put breakpoints in your Groovy and uh, walk through the code. So it's just inline debugging is, is you, know, you just connect to a remote server, and you can step through debug. And I think this is a huge benefit to Groovy. I, mean, I just talked about how we can kind of have this planet scale style deployment. And that's a lot like what people want from, from Lambda, right? I want to be able to uh, uh, deploy code and run it all over the place. Um, I want it to be very uh, simple. And uh, there's a lot of other things to Lambda too. I don't want to truly as Lambda, but, but you know, in, in, a, in a lot of ways, there's some similarities there too. And that Lambda is very hard to, to debug because you've got, you know, you've just got these code running anywhere in the cloud. But with Crafter, you can, um, you know, you can, again, you can use the inline debugger. So all you've got to do is connect to the JVM and that stuff lines up exactly with uh, with the breakpoints in your code. You haven't had any trouble with that. We have some resources online for that as well, some instructions and how to do that. Is there a specific question? Let's see if there's a follow-up to that. Go ahead and if you got a follow-up, um, then uh, to that, I'll, I'll try to get more specific. Uh, it says, can we do a complex content types in Crafter? So this is a very CMS specific question. So yes, I would, you know, and I'd interpret it a specific content type being, can I have, you know, um, more than just simple property sheets? Um, can I have relationships between content objects and things like that? And the answer is yes. In Crafter, you can, you, you have, obviously you have, properties that are simple fields like input boxes, you know, just a, just a, a text value or a rich text value or an image or something like that. And then you have repeat groups where you can have structures that your defined structure that repeats, and then you can have associations with other objects as well. And we are just going to keep pushing the boundary on, on, on that kind of content model. And there's, there's things you can do. Okay. Thanks uh, Martin for that question. Um, any other follow-up questions on debugging? Uh, there's some comments about uh, some other platforms. Let me check the questions and answers area. Again, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, if, if we don't have any other questions, I'll let, I'll let folks go here. All right, going once, going twice. All right, everybody, thanks so much for your time. Uh, again, if you want to learn more about Crafter, please uh, check us out at craftercms.org or I mean, we've got a lot of recorded webinars and things also on craftersoftware.com. So I'm um, looking forward to meeting you in the community or at our virtual booth. Have a great rest of your day.